It's Friday, everybody. And you know what that means? It means the weekend is approaching. But of course, more importantly, the weekend, it's Excel Friday. But before we get to Excel Friday, I do have some announcements that I want to make sure that we're clear up on. Uh, just a reflection of what I talked about on Monday. Uh, please make sure that you're thinking about your groups and your topics. And if you have not contacted me already, reach out to me if you have people that you want to be in a group with or if you have topic ideas. Um, like I said, we're going to try to resolve those before we go into uh, fall break, which is actually about a week and a half away. So uh, time flies and you're having fun, I guess. Um, also, uh, as far as uh, in the semester stuff goes, um, you do have a professional interaction that you are responsible for. Some of you have already submitted that. So thank you if you've done that. Uh, if you've not yet and you're looking for a professional interaction opportunity, there is a quite good one coming up this afternoon. Uh, you probably already received the email about it, but uh, the VP of Readiness at Boeing, uh, Chuck Woods, who's actually a uh, Bo or Truman alum from 1986, um, he's going to be presenting today over at Violet Hall 1000 at 3:30. So I think that would be a great opportunity if you want to uh, if you want to have something that you think would be good for a professional interaction, and that would be a good one to uh, to uh, attend. So please keep that in mind. All right, today we're going to be talking about some uh, some stuff. Uh, we're going to do our traditional Excel homework. Oh, yeah, I guess I should probably mention this. Um, so we're going to be doing um, our traditional Excel and homework uh, routine today. Uh, for the next two weeks, our, our kind of traditional routine is going to be a little bit interrupted because uh, starting on, on Monday, we're going to be doing Chapter 7, which is the last chapter before our exam. Then on Wednesday, we're just going to be doing Chapter 7 homework. So it's going to be a shorter time. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's just to give you guys a little bit of a chance to start working for Friday. Because a week from today, that's we're going to be doing our exam review. Uh, well, basically what the exam review entails is that uh, I will have I have a study guide and a practice exam already posted. And we will go over the study guide very, very quickly. I'm not going to spend, spend time going over every single point. I'm going to go over some of the things, the high points, and I'll let you all ask questions as you have them. And then we're going to go through the practice exam. So there's a few things that I want to make sure that we're clear on with this process. First of all, please make sure that you come to class prepared to ask questions about the study guide if you have them. Um, if there's something you need clarification on, specifically what you think I need to, uh, that you need to know for the exam, uh, you should ask questions then. Uh, secondly, please complete the practice exam before you come into class on Friday. Uh, it defeats the purpose of uh, coming into class and then listening to give you all the answers. The whole goal of the practice exam is to see what it is that you feel good at, what feel, what is it you still need to work at, and then you can work on that uh, over the weekend to prepare for the exam. Then we, uh, the week after that, Monday of week eight, uh, which is again about a week half away, we have our first exam uh, that will be here in this classroom. Uh, it is 20 multiple choice questions, and I think uh, two problems or one integrated problem. doesn't really matter how many problems there are. They're all kind of integrated, but I, I don't remember if I split it out in the one or two. Um, it's going to be very similar in format to what you will be doing for the practice exam. So uh, the practice exam will be good preparation. Uh, even though the content will be similar, I may ask you different conceptual questions on the exam. So don't just use the practice exam as your only source of studying. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm bringing that up now. Uh, then Wednesday before our fall break, we will uh, meet so we can go over the results of the exam, um, and that's going to be kind of our schedule for the next uh, week. And a half. Uh, once we get back from that, we'll start on Chapter 10, we'll get back to our kind of our routine that we uh, are following for the remainder of the semester. All right, let's go ahead. Let's talk about some Excel. So I wanted to talk about some things that I use in my personal work. Uh, it doesn't seem like these are going to come up that often. At least when I learned them, I didn't think I would use them that often. And it's actually surprising to me how frequently I use these. So some of these you're going to use actually quite a bit. Uh, some of these you will not use that much, or at least not think you're use that much. So, we'll start about it. so let's go ahead and talk about a very basic one. And I want to start this off by saying this is my class list, my class list. And you'll notice that your name is not on here. At least I hope it's not on here. These are randomized, uh, randomized first and last names that I created. It used to actually be my students, and then uh, again, the whole YouTube uh, cyberbullying scenario came up, and uh, yeah, that 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 kind of created problems. So that's why I use this list now. And one of the interesting things about Brightspace is that Brightspace organizes information by last name in almost every scenario. Every scenario it almost organizes by last name. So. If your last name begins with an A, you're usually going to be at the top. If your last name begins with a Z, you'll be at the end. The only time that doesn't happen is if I go to quizzes, my quizzes are always organized according to first name. I have no idea why that's the case. And so 
uh, alphabetization is a little bit problematic. I have to look for her stamps. It, it's a minor, minor complaint, but obviously if I'm trying to align quiz grades with uh, actual grades, not an issue in this course because there are no quiz grades, but if I have other courses, if I align quiz grades with actual grades, it's a little bit more challenging. So um, one of the ways to answer this is basically to sort information according to first and last name. You'll notice I've got these listed by first and last name. So I'm just going to do a simple sort on this. And uh, this is not particularly difficult. This is something that you're probably familiar with. There's a couple ways to go about this. You can do a right click and you can uh, resize. You shouldn't even do a right click. My gosh, have I gotten that old that you can't do right clicks anymore? Or right click sorts? Okay, now you just have to specify the array. You can't just do an entire column. Okay, sort A to Z. Um, the other way that you do it, the kind of more traditional way, would be uh, go to data. And now it's really just struggling. Okay. That is the first time that's ever happened is the visual basic. I've been noticing some really weird, uh, some really weird issues as of late when I click on data. It basically has some, had some uh, problems. It's trying to identify a macro, which is not there. So I apologize for that. Uh, anyway, hopefully you didn't encounter the same thing, but uh, go to data and go to sort. And it's going to say expand the selection because it's looking and saying there's something over here. We're going to look at that in just a second, but for right now, let's just stick with the selection. So we're going to sort. I, my data does have headers, so I didn't specify the headers, but that's the case. And then I can just sort by student name. Easy enough, all right? I don't anticipate that anybody probably had too much trouble with that. But uh, something I want to talk a little bit more about is how we use sort in unison with other tools. So one tool that I think is very important to know is called the auto filter tool. And you probably are familiar with this. Uh, this is actually also in the data tab. And basically, when you click on auto filter, it's going to create a new tool that will automatically be created in the first row, assuming you have header information. And this will allow you to do things such as sort. Okay, you can sort A to Z or Z to A. You can also sort by color if that uh, color exists. Uh, create text filters, and then you can even uh, process information. Like if I wanted to just pull up a one per a student's piece of information, then I can do that as well. But uh, I do think the auto filter with its versatility is a, one that you should become accustomed to using. I would use that very frequently, especially in large databases where I want to organize information. One nice thing about auto filter is that you can set a filter in one column and then set a separate filter in a different column. So if you want to sort across multiple parameters, that's going to be a really nice to have. You guys remember uh, some ifs and count ifs from uh, BSA 153? You can use auto filter to replicate those uh, um, those items. So that's one uh, nice feature about the auto filter function. All right, to get rid of auto filter, you just click on the filter task. Uh, let's talk about one that you may know already, but you may not think that you're going to use frequently. I will tell you that if I were to list probably my top 10 Excel functions, these, this, uh, this series of functions would actually be in the top 10 of ones that I use. And I would never have predicted this. I would have said, no, I probably will very use this. And it's going to be the RAND function. Okay? And so <clears throat> the RAND function is just basically a random number assignment, which you think well, random number assignment doesn't seem to be all that relevant, but I actually use it quite frequently. I just did a presentation on AI for my colleagues, and I used the randomization function to actually em or emulate something that was better with respect to how uh, large language models work. So what is the RAND function? Let's just talk about that, and then we're going to talk about the, some uh, variants on the RAND function. All the RAND function is is that basically you're going to type an R-A-N-D, and this is a weird function in that it doesn't have any actual items that are in part of the function. You're going to open the parentheses, and then it will immediately close the parentheses. And the RAND function will return a value between 0 and 1, a decimal value between 0 and 1, a random 1. So if I click on that, you will notice that it returns that value. And just like any other formula, it can be uh, copied down. It can be flash filled. What's very interesting about the RAND formula is, is that RAND formula is not a one-time instance. That if I change any source of input within the spreadsheet, it will change all of those RAND formulas. So if I click on this RAND formula up here and I just press enter, watch what happens to all the values. They all change. Now, that seems like it's really, really innocuous, but it's actually a really important function because that means that if you want to sort information at a random, on a random basis, you can continue doing that an infinite number of times because it will always change those values as you're moving forward. Now, where this comes in for me personally, this is the one, this is the application that I use it most frequently for particularly the graduate level courses, which are more Socratic in nature. By the way, I think I've talked about this. I tend not to use Socratic method in my undergraduate courses, which is a cold calling out students and asking for information. I use that a lot more frequently at the uh, graduate level. So if you're thinking about going to the graduate program and uh, you're just like really, really opposed to Socratic method, I don't want to discourage you from not coming in, but just get ready. That's something that I do. 
Um, but what if I want to create a random list of uh, students uh, and I want to say, I just want to call them in the random. I can actually use my filter according to the seed over on the right and just sort according to that column. So I can sort according to the seed column and we'll do that. And you will notice that I sorted this, but now after the act of sorting, it created a new random set of values. So now the numbers are no longer or, or aligned according to the sort. That doesn't mean the sort didn't work. Basically what happened is it sorted all the values originally. And then once the sort function completed, it randomized all those numbers again. So let's say I want to re-randomize re for another class period, okay? I just do the same thing and just keep doing that over and over again because it recreates a new random value every time you complete a task. So that's kind of a neat little uh, neat little feature that you might utilize uh, if, if you're creating randomized lists. That's the easiest way I found in Excel to actually create randomization. But uh, randomizing according to just a decimal point may not be helpful. So let's say that you've got certain values that you want to assign. And uh, this comes up less frequently, but still comes up occasionally, is uh, whether or not I want to assign values within certain parameters. So let's say that I want to say I want to have a value that uh, ranges between 1 and 100. And uh, again, there's no arbitrary conclusion to this. I'm not assigning people grades on a random basis. That would be really, really awkward if that was the case, though, OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a very a very similar function that's going to be rand between. And rand between specifies is basically a randomization function, but it's an integer function, meaning that you have to actually it's going to be a, a whole number, and it's going to be between a range that you specify. So I'm going to say one and one hundred, and then just copy that through. Now it's got similarities in RAND that every time I create a new, uh, I, I do something a new feat or new action in Excel, it will change the values of everything that's got that function in there. So again, I can kind of uh, just continue resetting values every single time. But in this case, it's actually giving me values within a specified range. Now that's very similar to what we did with RAND because RAND did have a specified range, but it's between zero and one. This one can be between any specified range that's an integer. Now, if you wanted to create a decimal value, you can manipulate this. This is something I do quite frequently. Say, for example, that I wanted to create a decimal value, but I know it's going to be 1, 100. I could say, well, then divide by 100. And I'm going to come up with a function very similar to what I would just do with RAND, which I realize that that uh, that's defeats the purpose, because if I just wanted to do that, I'd just use the RAND function. But again, if I wanted to say I wanted to have values between 50 and 100, I could do that and then create decimal places that are in there. A lot of versatility in that regard. And even so, again, it seems like it's completely and totally redundant. There's no reason why I would use this uh, function, but it comes up actually more frequently than you might encounter. The need for randomized information actually occurs quite frequently. So that's why I kind of wanted to talk about this particular function as part of this. But something that's probably more relevant to your careers is going to be time value of money analysis. All right. So you probably remember this back from your classes. You probably did this in, uh, I think everybody did this in 221. And uh, you probably have also done something similar to this in finance classes. This is one of those things that uh, I think when students learn this, they understand the basic application, but don't understand how relevant this will be in your lives moving forward. May not be as relevant right now, but it will be extremely relevant once you leave the uh, once you leave Truman State, because you're going to have be faced with a lot of decisions. So you're going to be faced with the decision of buying a new vehicle, or at some point maybe even buying a new house, assuming mortgage rates ever go down. They did they did cut them by half a point recently, but they're still ridiculous. All right, um, and then you're also going to I hate to tell you this, you're going to have to plan for retirement. It's like no, I'm not. That's way far away, Dr. Barnes. Only old people planning for retirement. I said, ouch. Okay. But yeah, you do need to think about retirement. And I will tell you right now, just as a personal, a personal personal, suggestion, thinking about it now will make you much happier than if you start thinking about it at my age, okay? I really only started really planning into retirement in my mid-30s, and that was much later than I should have. Plus, I took a five-year gap off of retirement savings because I got my PhD. So that's not something that I would advise for anyone. I would say start thinking about your retirement once you get out of school, if not earlier, okay? That's my big advice. And uh, that will make you much better off. But what, if, what kind of things are you going to think about? Well, one of the things that we need to talk about is how we actually use these numbers to come up with decision points. Some of you may be familiar with this already. Those of you who who've taken 303 or are currently taking 303, those wonderful amortization tables that you have to prepare, uh, this kind of relates to this, but this is more shorthand function in Excel. By the way, if you are working in 303 and have to create amortization tables, I will tell you, 
Excel is much easier for creating amortization tables. You basically have to create one line and then you copy it down however many times you want. It's really, really nice. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, tell doc, Dr. Shoney or Dr. Deers what they need to do. I'm just going to say they're, they're going to teach it your their way and I'm going to teach it mine. So let's go ahead and talk about some time value of money uh, tools that you would want to know. Some of these you may be familiar with. Some of these you may need to, uh, may be exposed to the first time. So we're going to do some simple scenarios. We're going to talk about you want to put in enough investment account today to have $100,000 in 10 years, which, by the way, $100,000 is not enough to retire on, okay? Not enough to retire on. I think uh, for my generation, the, the uh, statement was is that you want to have a million dollars for every family member. Uh, so if you're a retired couple, you want to have $2 million. I'm single, so fortunately, I don't have to worry about that. But that being said, that number is increasing as inflation increases, so that's something you have to concern yourself with. The good news is, like I said, if you think about this early enough, it's not a problem. So, again, making sure that you think about this much earlier than you would otherwise want to think about it. So, you want to have $100,000 in 10 years. Assuming you can generate a 7% rate of return compounded annually, how much would you need to invest? Well, this is pretty straightforward. We're just going to use something called the PV function, which is present value. So, equals PV. And then it says rate. We're going to start with just 7%. You can actually type in 7% or you could put in 0 0.07. Either one of those is fine. For the number of periods, it's going to be 10 years. And then for the payment, we're not doing payments just yet, so we don't actually need to any, enter any payment. So we're going to enter zero. And then I want to explain what's happening here, okay? We're going to enter the future value, which you'll notice the future value is $100,000, okay? So $100,000 would be our, our input. However, one thing that I always do with these formulas is I will always enter this numeric input for future value or present value in some of the situations that we're going to talk about as a negative number. The reason why is because when you enter input as a negative number, your result will come out as a positive number. Now, intuitively speaking, what we should be doing is interpreting what it is that we're, uh, what it is that we're trying to calculate, and the negative or positive value is going to be representative of that. So in this situation, I'm saying, okay, how much of an outflow do I need to have an inflow of $100,000 later? So intuitively speaking, this number should be a negative number. My result should be a negative number because I'm trying to calculate the payment now, the cash outflow now, for an inflow later. But just for clarity purposes, I tend to always want these results to be positive numbers, which is why I do negative inputs. So if you're a little bit confused by that, I'm more than happy to discuss it a little bit more at length. But right now, all you need to know is that to return a positive result, you need negative input. So $50,834.93 is what you need to invest today in order to get $100,000 in 10 years, assuming a constant rate of return of 10%. So there's a couple of interesting takeaways from this, okay? First of all, uh, you will notice that we had uh, 10 years and we had a 7% interest rate. So if you multiply those together, that's 70. There's an interesting investing shortcut called the rule of 70, which basically tells you that if the uh, interest rate times the number of periods equals 70, you're going to double your money in that time frame, okay? So those of you who are in BSIF probably know what I'm talking about. You've probably heard that shortcut before, all right? And so that's a very interesting hack that we can actually use moving forward. Another point that we're going to talk about is you may say, well, uh, that's great, Dr. Barnes, but I don't have $50,000 now, um, I, I, and it would take me a while to save that up. Don't worry, we're going to get to that, okay? We're going to get to that point. I, I realize that that's probably not a, uh, that's not a realistic assumption to have right now. But we have to start simple before we get more complex. So next is going to say you place sixty thousand dollars in an investment account that you yield seven percent per year compounded annually. If you leave your investment in place for ten years, how much money can you have at the end of ten year period? Well, this is a pretty easy one as well. But we're not asking what do we need now. We're asking what will we have in the future. Now this is the same situation as before. We're talking about ten years at seven percent. That's seventy. So intuitively speaking, what should this number be approximately? Since we're dealing with the rule of seventy. 120,000. Okay, so we're going to expect it to be around 120,000. Well, let's do the actual calculation. So for this one, we're going to be doing future value. And the inputs are going to be identical with the exception of putting in a present value instead of a future value. So 7% again, 10 years. We're not doing payments yet, which we'll get to that, I promise. And then I'm going to put a negative 60,000 in for my present value. In this situation, negative 60,000 is actually accurate because it is an outflow, whereas my inflow is going to be what I receive at the end of the period, that future value. So 118,000 roughly, so pretty close to 120,000. So that rule of 70 holds pretty closely. 
Not accurate, exactly accurate, but it's pretty close, pretty close. All right, now we're gonna be talking about some decisions that are gonna be more relevant to what you're gonna have concerns for in the future. So you suddenly realize that you don't have $60,000 lying around. I hate it when that happens. You know, you're just at home watching Netflix and you're just kind of like, yeah, I don't have $60,000 in my bank account. Is that, if I happen to anybody else to, uh, other than me, you know, yeah, just, you know, just lying around, just kind of thinking about, man, life would be so much easier if I just had easy $60,000 ready. Uh, you decide to make payments to your investment account that have $1,000 at the end of every month, okay? Which sounds like a lot now, but you all are going to be super successful after graduating from Truman. That's not going to be a big deal. You're going to be able to make that pretty easily. Assuming a, seven, a rate, rate of return of 7% compounded monthly, how much can you expect in the investment to be worth in 10 years, okay? So we're going to change some things now, okay? We're going to change some things. First of all, this is another future value equation because we're trying to calculate what's happening in the future. <clears throat> But now we need to make some changes. So the first thing we need to know is our rate has to change slightly. It's still going to be 7%, but how frequently are we compounding? We're compounding monthly. So if that's the case, we want to rate on a monthly basis. So we're going to divide 7% by 12. Then the number of periods. We're still at 10 years, but again, we need this on a monthly basis. How many months are in 10 years? Well, you could just type in 120 because that's simple math, or you could do 10 times 12. All right, now we're going to do payments. This is actually telling that we're not starting with any base value. We're going to be actually making payments. Now, let's just go ahead and type in negative 1,000 because those are our outflows at the end of every period. And technically speaking, we don't need to enter any other information, but I do want to talk about what the rest of these optional inputs are. So if payment, payment, present value, so PV, uh, we're going to say that's zero. We're, seven, we're starting with nothing, okay? Then finally, we've got this thing called type. Now, you've probably heard the terms ordinary annuity and annuity due. This actually specifies when the payment is going to occur. Generally speaking, when I do problems like this, I don't really mess with that. I usually just default to ordinary annuity, which is going to be end of period. But practically speaking, you're probably not going to be using that. You probably would be doing an annuity due. It doesn't really matter. The only difference is, is that you will end up with a slightly different number, simply because at one situation, you're making payments at the beginning of the period. So you have an entire month for pay interest to accrue on one of your payments. Other situation, you have an entire month before you make your payment, so there's going to be no accrual. It will result in different amounts, but this difference is very subtle, okay? So we're just going to assume annuity due. I'm just going to say zero here. If you want to do an annuity due, that's absolutely fine, okay? I think, yeah, ordinary annuity, so annuity at the beginning or at the end of the period. If you want to do an annuity due, that's fine. And so $173,084.81. Now, that's kind of interesting because this is actually $1,000 a month for 120 months, and we end up with $173,000, which, again, is not enough to retire on. But most of you will have about 40 years or so before you can retire, maybe less if you're really, really financially savvy. Imagine if we take this number and then we multiply it over a scale of uh, uh, four times that, okay? So we have a chance to double that every four, every 10 years, okay? So doubling 170,000, 340,000, doubling it again is going to be uh, 700 and uh, 780,000, doubling it again. That's going to be uh, 1,560,000. That's just with 10 years of making payments. That's not even, not even paying attention to the fact that you're probably going to be contributing more to your investment account for the next 30 years after that. But if you just were just kind of like, okay, I'm going to contribute for 10 years and that's it. I don't want to contribute ever more, anything more. As long as you're able to get that rate of return, which is pretty reasonable, you could have 1.5 million at the end of 40 years, which is kind of nice. So something to consider. All right. Now let's imagine that you have the goal of accumulating 100,000 100, by making payments to an investment account at the end of 10 months or every month for 10 years. Assuming a rate of return of 7% compounded monthly, how much do your monthly payments need to be to reach your goal? So now we're talking about an end objective, and we're saying, what does our payment need to be? By the way, this is extremely relevant when you start thinking about house or buying a house or by thinking about start buying a car. You're going to want to start with, all right, how much can you afford? And then that would actually dictate what the car can be. So what if it, you want to say, uh, if I want to buy a car that costs $30,000, how much would my monthly payments be? And this would be a way to, for you to figure that out. So let's just go ahead and use this. This is going to be the payment function, PMT. And again, we're going to do 7%. But remember, it's going to be every month, so we're going to divide that by 12. Then we're going to do number of periods. It's going to be 10 times 12, or 120, whichever you prefer. Present value is going to be 0, because we currently don't have anything. But we're trying to achieve a future value of 100,000. 
which I'm going to set as negative because I want my result to come up. And again, this is where you can specify a type if you want to make the payments from the beginning of the period to end of period. I'm just going to default to end of period, which is the default for Excel. And the answer is, if you wanted to have $100,000 in 10 years at 7%, you need to uh, make payments, monthly payments of $577.75, which doesn't seem all that uh, all that difficult, okay? If you can find some way to have an extra $600, then in 10 years, you can have an extra $100,000, okay? And I know what some of you are thinking right now. It's like, okay, $600 in 120 periods and just do that? I can throw a massive party for $100,000, okay? If you are thinking that, invite me in 10 years, okay? I'll be old, but I still will know how to party, okay? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever said that statement. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, some other tools uh, that we want to talk or to use. Uh, so uh, you probably remember net present value and eternal rate of return from uh, 221. The great news about Excel is you don't have to do these long hands. You can actually use Excel tools to calculate these. So now you've accumulated $100,000, you want to retire. Do not retire at $100,000. Not a good idea, okay? You will be back in the workforce before you know it, all right? But for sake of this example, we're going to assume that you're able to do so. Your plan is to withdraw $10,000 every year for the next 20 years, which uh, hopefully, if that's the case, that you've got a, a, a very, very good infrastructure, like you've got a garden that's self-sufficient that you can feed yourself on for the next uh, few decades, okay? $10,000 every year for the next 10 years. Send me a rate of return using an IR function to determine if your plan will work. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say equals NPV. Or we're going to say rate of 7%. And then you notice that it will say that you have to put in value after value after value. The great news about Excel, as long as there's not a specified range for value, we can actually do it as an array. So let's just go ahead and comma. And then we're going to highlight the beginning input and then all the cash flows subsequent out to that, which fortunately have been provided for you, but not particularly difficult to put together. And then we're gonna close our function. And you will notice here it says negative 5 million or $5,551.54, which that negative is really important. What is this telling us right here? Will our plan be successful if we wanted to withdraw $10,000 every year for the next 20 years? Not at a 7% rate of return, that we don't have enough money, okay? We need more than $100,000 or, we need a higher return. So what return do we need? Well, that's gonna be answered this next question. We're gonna say equals IRR. And then we're just gonna highlight just the same way we did. We don't need to actually specify a, a rate. It will calculate the rate for us. So if we wanted to actually work this plan out, $100,000 in, uh, and then withdraw $10,000 every year, we need a rate of return of 7.75%. I would say that using Excel for these tools is much easier than trying to use a table from some tables from a textbook, which is one reason I like this, why I try to talk about this. Again, the more acclimated that you get to financial planning tools in using those in Excel, the easier it will be for financial decision making. And I think that above anything that I'm going to teach you in this course, I mean, I know that you all are going to be like saying, well, I know UML diagrams and BPMN diagrams, you're going to brag to your friends. I would much rather you be competent at this stuff, because this is going to be stuff that you will use not just in your career, but in your lives as well. All right, with that, we're done with Excel for today and Excel for a few weeks for now. So let's go ahead and talk about some homework. All right, some of these homework problems, pretty good. Some of them, not so much, but we'll talk about those. So the first question is very easy, but there's a reason why I wanted to actually include this first question in our homework. It's because I want to make sure that you are thinking about not just what the items are in the uh, our items are in a particular process area, but thinking about them at a basic level of stuff that uh, does not belong or things that do not belong. And so, again, I know that it's very easy to default and say all of the above has got to be the answer because that's always the answer. Well, first of all, it's not always the answer in the book. It is more than more than I would like it to be. I will warn you that on the exam, it is rarely the answer. Okay. So I do want you to be thinking about every single answer and not just the last one that's given. In this particular case, it says, which of the following is not an activity in the purchasing and payments process? So let's walk through each of these and make sure that we know, we know these. So first of all, in purchasing, are we gonna request prices from a supplier? Yes, we are gonna request prices from the supplier or the vendor. Are we gonna receive those items, hopefully? Yes. Yeah, so if you say no, then you probably don't have a lot of confidence in your suppliers, that's really bad. Are we going to pay for those items? Again, if you're no, you're unethical, okay? We're all always gonna pay because we're good people. Are we going to bill the customers? Okay, 
What part of what process are customers involved in? Are they involved in purchasing? Or are they involved in revenues? Revenues, okay, that's customers generate revenues. They are part of purchases. There's a relationship there, but that's not part of the purchasing process. That's part of the revenue process. So bill of customers is not going to be an activity in this process, all right? Now, again, I'm not gonna to try to trick you overtly with something like this. This is a really simple question, but it's also deceptive because we just wanna accept it and move on. So make sure that you understand what the elements are for each of these, because that's a really important takeaway for this. And by the answer, being deep, deep, by deep being the answer, E cannot be the answer. All right, number two, which of the following, or which, which activity results in an increase to accounts payable? So what are we talking about here? We're talking about where does liability recognition occur? We actually have multiple questions on this, and I actually selected these multiple questions because I think this is such an important question. So remember, we have two transactions. We have the recognition of the payable, and then we have the clearing of the payable because we actually make payment to our, to our vendor. Both of those transactions, knowing when those occur, are really, really important. Now, the payment is really easy because that's going to take place when we say pay the vendor or pay the supplier. That transaction is pretty easy to recognize, but the question here is, which is going to be uh, the point that we recognize liability, where the liability recognition occurs? So is it when we request the prices at the beginning of the process? No, they've not performed any uh, services for us or provided any goods, so that's not going to be the case. When we place the purchase order. Purchase orders, when we say, here's what we'd like to order from you. If you approve it, please deliver this to us. Okay, so we give them a document, probably not a physical document anymore, more of an electronic one, but you can see what I'm doing here, okay? delivering the document to them, and then so presumably they're going to receive, we're going to receive the items. They're going to send those items to us. Have they met their obligation to us in that scenario? <laughs> On the revenue side, that's when they would recognize revenues. So if that's the case, does it make sense for us to recognize a liability and obligation to pay them? Yes, okay, this is when we'd recognize that obligation. That's where we would basically credit our accounts payable and debit our purchases or inventory. Again, as a reminder, the transaction was given in the slides and you were wondering if there's a, what's the difference between purchasing and inventory that is solely based on the accounting system. I'm not gonna make you know the difference between periodic and perpetual inventory system. I think it's a good idea to know the difference, but I'm not gonna test you on that, okay? It's just gonna be one of those two accounts. It doesn't really matter which one you put. If I ask you to replicate that journal entry, either one would be fine. So return check item and send payment, obviously are not the case. It's gonna be receive items. All right. Which of the following is not an example of an application control, which is interesting about a control because if you actually went online and downloaded the uh, the, the uh, grade book for the, or the uh, sorry, the instructor's manual for this, and you were just basically saying, I'm gonna answer questions from the grade book, I'm just gonna circle. The grade book is actually wrong on this, okay? The grade book gave the wrong answer. So uh, uh, again, I, this will be an interesting one. I can check and see everybody's answers, see what they came up with. And if they circled the wrong answer, I'll say, oh, they might've had the grade book available, all right? I only mention that because the very first time I taught out of this book, I actually gave the wrong answer and I was really embarrassed, okay? So this is pretty easy though. This is a pretty easy question, all right? Because what we're talking about is what is the non-example of application control? So we have two types, general or access controls and application controls. Those are the two types IT controls. In that case, if we're talking about not an application control, it's something that's outside of the scope or is an access control. What term are we generally looking for when we're looking for an access control? What, what entity are we generally dealing with? Employees, yes, employee activity, employee activity. If it's an application control, we're talking about system activity or system, uh, system uh, controls, okay? So basically, we're looking for something that's not a system-based control. Now, two of these are easy to eliminate because it says system supplies the asset, uh, supplier address for payment, and the system creates audit trail for documenting all changes. So these are both application controls. What about A, range checks ensure that purchases are limited to valid amounts. Does that sound, sound like something a system would do? Certainly does, okay. So A is also going to be an application control, which leaves us B or all of the above. Employee making disbursements cannot modify purchase orders. Does that sound like an application control? That sure sounds like an access control. That's the, in fact, it is, okay. That's the answer, which again, by the way, if you use the, uh, if you use the instructor manual, the instructor manual says D or E is the answer which is definitely not the answer, okay? This is also one of the hazards of uh, having uh, people write questions that are not actually acclimated to the uh, discipline is that they'll check the answers and they'll say, well, that makes sense to me without actually knowing the answer. This happens occasionally in the McGraw-Hill textbooks, although generally it's pretty good quality. This is just one of those answers that uh, kind of makes me chuckle. All right, so the important stuff here, talking about UML uh, for preparation, so we need to understand resources, events, and agents. Which of the following is a resource? in 
a purchase and payment structure model. So not only are we talking about which of the following is a resource, but also a resource that we would include in one of our UML diagrams, okay? So let's go ahead and let's work through this, okay? Employee labor, is that a resource? <clears throat> it absolutely is a resource, okay? Remember, remember your Dr. Otero teaching back in 221 or cost accounting, whichever one you've been, or whoever your 221 instructor is, say, okay, what are the three costs? Materials, labor, overhead, you know, those are resources, okay? All right, those are resources. But is this a resource that's part of purchasing? Part of the purchasing function? Not really. We generally don't go to vendors if we want to acquire labor, okay? Generally, that's going to be a different part of the area. So it is a resource, but not usually identified as part of the purchasing payments, okay? What about receipt of goods? What do we call that? Not a resource. It's what? An event. What about paying by check? Okay, so that's a cash, uh, cash disbursement. We call that a, or an event, to good grammar, an event, okay? And then uh, inventory. Inventory, is that a resource? Yes, would it be a resource that we include in our purchase and purchasing uh, process? Yes, it would be, okay? It's one of those primary resources that we uh, purchase. So inventory would probably be our answer. Supplier, supplier's what? Agent, supplier's an agent, okay, good. All right, moving forward, which of the following is an agent in the purchasing finance and structure model? We don't really need to go through every single answer on this one, so we just specified supplier as an agent. Is supplier an agent in the purchasing model? In other words, do we purchase from suppliers? I hope so, okay? If we're purchasing from ourselves, that's probably a really weird business model, okay? Really weird business model. So C, yeah, E is our answer for uh, number seven. Number eight, which of the following is an event in the purchase and payment structure model? Cash. Is cash an event? Cash is what? Resource, good, okay. Inventory is what? We already talked about this one. Resource, good, okay. An employee is what type of uh, what type of class is an employee? Agent, good, okay. Cash disbursement, that is event, and that's our event that we're talking about here. Cash disbursements are event in the purchase and payment structure model. Now, this is an event specifically with this purchase and payment structure model. What if I change this to cash receipt? Would it still be an event? Yes. Would it be an event in the purchase and payment structure model? No. Remember, cash receipt is exclusive, in our scenarios, is exclusive to revenue model, okay, the revenue process. Now, there are other ways that we can receive cash, but they're not going to be one of our primary three process areas. So we're going to say cash disbursements, our, payment, our purchasing model, our purchasing, uh, purchasing process, cash receipts, our revenue process. Which of the following events would indicate the recording of a purchase in the AIS? Again, we're talking about liability recognition. We don't really need to think too much about this. This is going to be drilled home so hard. What is going to be our event where we recognize liability? Uh, that is going to be received goods, okay, received goods. That's when we, the, we that's when the, our vendor can recognize their, their respective revenue. That's the case. That's when we have a liability to them to pay for our, pay for our purchase. All right. Moving on to question number 26 and 27. So I want to go through these. So I apologize for this, first of all. If you click on this diagram link, it actually doesn't link you to a BPMN diagram. It links you to a UML diagram, which, uh, again, is one of those little foibles about electronic teaching. Somebody who's doing the uh, programming for the leagues is like, okay, it's linking to a diagram. That's all I need to know. All right. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the BPMN diagrams uh, so that we can understand how to answer. So let's, first of all, say we're dealing uh, Drawing an activity diagram of the process, which of the following is not true about your diagram? So let's just take a really quick look at this diagram. This is a very basic diagram that we've looked at before. We're going to move on to a collaborative diagram in just a second, but we're going to talk about this one right here. So this is a pretty straightforward diagram. We say what's not true. So issue purchase order task occurs before the receive purchase task. That doesn't make any sense. Why would we, why would we issue a purchase order after we receive goods? We have to actually have that before. Just intuitively speaking, it makes sense. I want to come back to B, okay, because B is a little bit confusing. So then the process starts with a customer placing a sales order. Is that true? What do you guys think? So, I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, I think I said something wrong, and I think that's why I'm confused. The purchase order task occurs before the receipt purchase task. That is a true statement, by the way. I apologize because I was getting those transposed. So purchase order does occur before the purchasing task, so that's a correct statement. I think I said it was not correct. It is correct. My bad. All right. I'll come back to B. Customer place a sales order. Is that what we call when the customer places a sales order? Okay. So customer, first of all, is involved in which process? 
revenue process, okay? They do issue an order, but if they would be issuing a purchase order to us, we would generate a sales order on the revenue side. Regardless of any of this, this is not part of the purchase order. So we can eliminate that. That's our answer right here. The process ends when the vendor is paid. Is the vendor getting paid in the uh, purchasing process? We hope so, because we're good people. We always pay our vendors. Now, B is the outlier. B is a little bit weird. It says process could be modeling as a living task that would show multiple purchases following one purchase order, which is a little bit confusing because we haven't talked about that. This is where you need to use your judgment on this. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's just use a road assumption. Is it possible that I could coordinate a series of uh, periodic purchases with a vendor saying, we want to buy the same item from you every month for the next 12 months? Is that a possible contract I can engage in? Yes. So basically every month we come back to this, we don't need to request price and availability. We actually create an activity here, which generates a new purchase order, but it's on a periodic uh, basis. So remember that clock that we had down here in this diagram, we say, okay, at some point in time, a new activity is created. That would be a loop that we would create within their diagram. Is that possible that we could do something like that? Sure sounds reasonable. It sure sounds completely reasonable that we could say, for the next year, we're going to buy from you every month. In fact, many businesses do something like that. We would just need to integrate in this diagram. We just have to say, okay, after one month, come back, place a new purchase order. And that's basically all we would do. So B is certainly possible, even though we didn't specifically talk about it. This is what we'd say, all right, what is this asking me? And how would I put this into a diagram? Now, again, I will not ask you this on the exam. These are homework questions. This was a little bit more detailed than I expect. But I do think it's a, a nice thing to talk, think about, a nice uh, concept to uh, examine. Question number 127. Assume you're drawing a collaboration activity uh, BPN diagram of the process. So collaboration basically means that there's going to be more than one entity. So we're the entity is one. We're basically the, uh, in, the one, in, this, in this case, we're the customer. And we're talking to the supplier, who's the other entity. So we're collaborating with those, those which the following would not be message, message flows on the diagram. Well, let's just take a look because we actually have a collaboration diagram. So we've got quote, order, delivery, invoice, and payments. Those are all message flows. So order, purchase order, delivery was one of those. Uh, disbursement, that's the payment. Inventory update. Do we actually have an inventory update message flow in our diagram? No, we don't. And so D would be our answer. Okay, D would be our answer. Well, this is kind of confusing because there's a whole bunch of all of the above and none of them were correct in this situation. Told you to be careful. Told you to be careful. Yeah. All right. Final questions. Moving on. Discussion question number three. Draw an activity model using the BPMN for the process you follow when you purchase textbook for the current semester. Okay. So there's a lot of different variants that you could use here. Um, if you created a simple UML di or sorry, simple BPMN diagram, that's fine. This was not giving you a specific narrative. So the example I'm going to give you here is not a correct answer. If I ask you this question on the exam, which I will not ask you this specific question on the exam, but if I ask you this question on the exam, I would be looking at some iteration of the following, okay? So the answer that the uh, solution manual gives is this one right here. So you determine what the required textbooks are. How do you do that? You go to the syllabi for the instructor and say, is this a required text, yes or no? Sometimes you'll just go directly to the bookstore and it'll say, this is required for the course, okay? But you'll actually specify that on your own. You'll determine where you're going to purchase that, whether you're going to buy them from the bookstore or from an online source. I know that's kind of a, a, a good source. Maybe this would be a good time for me to plug actually discount textbooks because I'm constantly getting emails from them and they're saying they will match any prices on Amazon. So if you want to go buy from them, I don't know about the bookstore at Truman Stand. I'm assuming it's the same thing there as well. But Tony over at discount, discount Textbook constantly emails me and says we'll match any prices. So I can use this as a lesson and encouragement for you guys to visit there. Okay. Because you'll like CSA says it'll match those prices. Anyway, uh, you got to purchase the textbooks and then you receive your texts. Okay. You will notice what's not up here. It's like, do not buy textbooks at all. Okay. Which, by the way, if I ask you this question on the exam, which I won't, but if I ask you this question on the exam, that's not one of the options, by the way. Okay. You should buy textbooks. And if you say, well, Dr. Barnes, I didn't buy the textbooks from this class, don't tell me that. Okay. Don't tell me that. Okay. I, I don't want to know that it's because the required piece of material. So, again, the activities. We may even uh, be able to eliminate this gateway, although I do like the fact that the gateway is open and closed. I, I do appreciate that. But if you just basically said, I don't buy anywhere that other than online sources, or I don't buy anywhere other than the bookstore, one of those two, then the gateway is not relevant because you are always going to go to the one of those sources. So we could say required items, where uh, required items purchased in the bookstore, received text. It could be a simple three activity, uh, a simple three activity diagram. 
I think you could probably simplify this even further. But there are certain elements that I'm looking for, such as the starting event, the ending event, and the activities that are relevant here. That's all there really is to it. Last question for today. So basically, we have a narrative for the tablet store, and it's talking about uh, how it's uh, selling iPads and it purchases tablets directly from the manufacturer, uh, submitting purchase orders directly to the manufacturer, um, so on and so forth. Uh, basically, it's a straightforward standard purchasing process. So let's go ahead and take a look at our UML diagram. This was kind of our standard UML diagram I said for the purchasing process. So can we say that this UML diagram would be suitable for this particular narrative that we just talked about? It does take in all of the elements, because remember, first part of the UML diagram is to identify our resources, events, and agents, okay? Now, there are a little bit different terminologies, but for the most part, there's uh, pretty much direct overlap. We know that our products are going to be tablets, so you can use products. Or you could just specify that we're going to buy specifically tablets here. We know that we're going to be issuing a purchase order and paying at some point in the future. So purchase orders listed up here. Then we actually have this uh, respective purchases and then the respective cash disbursements. Okay. Who is responsible for doing that? Our employees are actually responsible for the purchase. And they're purchasing from the manufacturers, which in this diagram is just listed as suppliers. If you decided to take this, if you went to my slides, you just copied and pasted this into your, uh, into your uh, answer, that would be correct. I would accept that as a correct answer. Okay. Now, if you went to a little bit longhand, tried to interpret this, then I, I encourage you to do so because learning about the process is really important as well. So we want to make sure that we understand what parts we would want to include. And the answer is basically everything here. Now, I do want to talk about a couple of things because I want to show you basically what the book says in the answer. I want to talk about some of the differentiations here. So the book here, this is the answer it gives. And you will notice that we're missing an event here. And we talked a little bit about this during uh, during our presentation or during presentation on Monday or Monday. When we went through this on Monday, I said, is it necessary to have full three events? And the answer is not not necessarily. It's not not important that we have all three, all three events, but there are certain conditions that have to be met. OK, usually speaking, we want to have a purchase order uh, activity up here because the purchase order is going to be separate from purchases. But what if we assume that every time a purchase order is issued, that there's going to be a corresponding purchase? Does that ne necessitate the need for a purchase, or a purchase order up here? The answer is probably not. And that's what the book is trying to get at when they talk about this particular concept here, is that we don't have to include a separate activity because when a purchase order is issued, there is always going to be a purchase that follows it. So that's why they can constrain that as one activity. Okay, so again, Something to think about as you're thinking about how to prepare for the exam. I would, if you're uncomfortable with this concept, if you're uncomfortable with the idea of uh, trying to actually create just a single activity or encompass two separate steps, I would encourage you to remember to focus on the diagram that was included in the slides. But for the most part, these are the same diagram. The only step that's different is the fact that we don't have a purchase order activity here, simply because they spe they specified that a purchase order will always result in a purchase. Last part of the question was, we're creating a relational database for accounts payable. How do we do that based on the resources that's created here? So where does accounts payable come from? Accounts payable is basically specifying this is still what's owed to suppliers. Okay. And we've generally said accounts payable is a standalone onto itself, but we don't have accounts payable in our entity diagram here. Or do we? So can we determine accounts payable based on the information given in this diagram? Yes, because we know total purchases. That's going to be accounts payable. That's how we generate the accounts payables. We make a purchase because it's going to be on credit. <laughs> the outstanding accounts payable is going to be whatever purchases have taken place minus any cash disbursements. Okay. So if we wanted to create a relational database, we need to specify we take all of our purchases, subtract all of our cash disbursements. That should equal our outstanding accounts payable, which also, by the way, is a nice check for the relational database because if it stores accounts payable in a separate ledger, we can make sure that those two numbers match. And if they don't match, uh, investigate why those numbers don't, uh, don't correlate. All right, so that's it for today. We'll start chapter seven on Monday. I'll see you all then. Have a good weekend.